Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all for today's uh, virtual fireside chat. Um, we'll be talking about understanding the acceleration of socioeconomic inequality. Uh, my name is Asim Jaswaja. I am the director for the Center for International Development at Harvard University. Uh, and today I'm just absolutely thrilled to introduce uh, two of my colleagues um, who will be um, sort of um, in this conversation today. Um, uh, the event is hosted by CID, but also um, very much by the Harvard Kennedy School India Caucus, which is a student-led organization designed to be a platform for discussion on issues related uh, to, to, to India. Um, at CID, we really encourage collaboration with student organizations, so we're really thrilled uh, to the HKS India Caucus for working with us uh, uh, to arrange the uh, event today. Um, my two guests are, um, I, I, I don't think I need to introduce either of them, but I will briefly do so. Um, um, we are, are uh, joined by Raghuram Rajan, who is the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago uh, School of Business, and um, uh, served as the governor of the Reserve Bank of India as well. Um, in addition, uh, we're joined by my own colleague, Professor Danny Roderick, who's a Ford Foundation Professor for International Political Economy at the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as an advisory member uh, of our faculty council. Um, I should say that I'm, I'm particularly excited because I consider at a more personal level, both Raghu and Danny to be mentors of mine. Um, you know, I feel like uh, you really learn how to respect people and see who they are when you're in a position of weakness and they're in a position of power. And both Raghu and Danny were senior colleagues of mine when I was just starting as a junior uh, faculty member. And I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with both of them, which have been instrumental in, in, in my own career, in my own intellectual growth. So I'm just personally very thrilled to have them both. I've learned always from them. I hope to learn today from them as well and I hope to continue learning from them. Um, our conversation today is going to be very much on what is, I think, the challenge of our century. Uh, it's inequality has always been a problem. The COVID pandemic has made it not only more salient uh, in a way that we recognize the fractures in our society and we see them in their glory, uh, in their terrible glory, uh, but also it's exacerbated. This, 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 this recession, this crisis is worse than any we have seen in the past. And today we have both Raghu and Danny uh, who really are leading thinkers in this area. We will start with a more global discovery of this problem and then work towards kind of more specific cases drawing on our panelists' experiences. With that, let me hand over to Danny. Uh, thank you again for the audience, and thank you, Danny and Raghu, for making the time with us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Asim and CID, and also very much to the HKS uh, India Caucus and all the students who worked hard uh, to make this happen. Uh, Sarah, uh, thanks a lot for all the hard work behind the scenes. I'm absolutely delighted. I mean, you know, um, uh, Raghu is is you know one of my favorite favorite uh, economists, and uh, um, I'm 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 very happy that I get the chance now to ask him some questions, um, and 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 hear uh, his views on some of the most important questions of our time, as as Awesome uh, said. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to say more about Raghu than, than what um, Asim has already uh, said, um, except to say that uh, in addition to uh, his extensive uh, um, scholarly work and research work on, on banking and finance, um, he has also written some uh, extraordinary books, um, uh, the latest of which is, um, is, uh, is called The Third Pillar, came out in 2019, um, talks about the importance of community um, and, and how uh, globalization and technological trends are leaving community behind. Um, it's a set of issues that I want to examine with him um, and I want to ask him about uh, uh, but uh, before we get into the details, um, I, I'd like to ask Raghu to start us off with a, a kind of a general overview of um, where 
uh, you think we're going uh, in the world economy with respect to particularly inequality within countries, between countries? Um, is COVID um, a, a significant uh, break uh, in some of the economic advances that we've seen in the developing world? Um, just your, your, your broad views on where we're, we're headed. Uh, Raghu, it's yours. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you, Asim. This, uh, it's a pleasure, of course, being uh, with, uh, with, with friends. And uh, uh, I think uh, the mutual respect we have is, is tremendous. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit. Uh, I, I'd love to hear from Danny also. Uh, he's written so much, uh, such influential uh, work on, on some of the issues we're going to talk about. So we'll, we'll keep it as more of a conversation. Uh, just in terms of preliminaries and where we, we are, uh, we certainly, it's, uh, it's uh, almost commonplace to say we're living through unprecedented times, uh, certainly in living memory. Uh, we've uh, had the pandemic and the ever morphing virus. And, uh, you know, as much as the tragic harm it has caused, uh, there's also, uh, uh, you know, uh, something to uh, to celebrate in the fight against it. Of course, the many heroic people uh, who have uh, who have combated the virus, but also the scientists um, and innovators who have come up first with vaccines in a record period of time, but also treatments. Uh, this is not to say there haven't been downsides, the unequal distribution of the vaccine, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about, I presume, uh, is certainly uh, a failure of global cooperation. But uh, one shouldn't diminish the fact that, uh, uh, that we have vaccines at all, that we have treatments at all, is uh, a celebration of, uh, of modern capabilities. Uh, we've also had an extraordinary fiscal and monetary response, especially in industrial countries. And so much so that if you look at the uh, you know, uh, incomes uh, after transfers in, uh, in, for example, the United States, it didn't really go down over the pandemic. Um, that reflects uh, the extent of response. Look at bankruptcies. Uh, they actually went down, uh, both for large firms and small firms. So there has been enormous support this time around. Um, of course, this is not uniform across the world. And th this is where uh, I, I think the issues of inequality start showing up. There's been a lot of differentiation across countries. There's also differentiation within countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, in the uh, industrial countries, I would argue there's been a lot more support uh, for poorer people, for smaller firms, while in the emerging markets, that has not been the case. And uh, as a result, inequality within some of those emerging markets, which were con converging to industry, uh, you know, uh, a, a, at a moderate pace, um, uh, to uh, higher incomes, uh, what you're seeing is much more differentiation within those countries. Uh, at the same time, uh, one has to worry about uh, some of the trends we've seen in the recent past. Uh, clearly, the extent of leveraging, both financial and non-financial, has increased. Um, you know, uh, government balance sheets, of course, have become more indebted. But even corporate and household balance sheets, uh, households in the U.S. Uh, have sort of um, reduced some of their debt loads. But in some other countries, uh, certainly India. Uh, they're in the process of increasing it. Um, there's also been a lot of innovation. Uh, I talked about the real innovations in vaccines and, and pharmaceuticals, but there's a lot of innovation in the financial sector. Some of it seemingly good, but yet untested. Uh, you know, um, uh, for example, some of the fintech uh, uh, processes to lend more to people. Uh, how does that fare in a downturn? We don't know. And it's part of the overall leveraging so we will know when we do get a, a serious uh, recession in, in, uh, in, in the places where this has expanded. Um, and, and, and finally, at this point, um, we may have too much of a good thing uh, with strong demand after many years of really weak demand. We have the prospect of rising inflation and higher interest rates, perhaps for the first time in, uh, in more than a decade. Uh, monetary policy is faced with a, with, uh, uh, with a serious prospect of tightening. 
And what do higher interest rates do for uh, economies where asset prices are so high and uh, you know they're high across the world, whether it's industrial countries or emerging markets? So um, not all these are a consequence of the pandemic. Some are trends that have been in place for a number of years, but we can talk about it. Um, I think, uh, let me just emphasize the, the outlook is different for industrial countries where still the prospect is of uh, strong demand exceeding supply despite some setbacks uh, because of rising uh, COVID cases, both in the US and Europe. Um, and uh, the risk of overheating is still much higher than falling back into the weak demand uh, secular stagnation world of the post-global financial crisis pre-pandemic era. Um, however, it's, it's different in emerging markets. Other than perhaps some of the emerging markets in North Asia, such as Taiwan, Korea, and potentially China. Um, the outlook look, is much bleaker in, in many emerging markets, uh, masked by a strong uh, rebound uh, post, uh, post uh, pandemic. Um, as you know, uh, far fewer people can work from home in emerging markets. Bangladesh, 10%, uh, according to one estimate of jobs can be done from home. Uh, the US, Canada is 45%. So big difference. And as a result, many people have suffered from the lockdowns. Uh, and of course, the virus has done tremendous damage in a number of countries. These countries have had little monetary or fiscal room to prevent economic scarring, and the scarring has been significant under the radar screen right now because uh, many countries have experienced some rebound uh, from the uh, because of pent up demand, because of upper middle class households having spending capacity. Uh, but the question is, how long uh, will this continue? And of course, because uh, fewer have been vaccinated and the rollout is still slow in a number of these countries, uh, if in fact there are further waves, uh, we're seeing uh, one already strong in, in Europe, if this spreads to the emerging markets of the developing countries, uh, it will be yet another body blow to what is already uh, a weak prospect. Um, the divisions, and this is what uh, we will talk about and end on, are substantial within these countries. I mean, take the example of India, large firms doing really well. If you look at the top 500 listed firms, the top 100 saw an increase in sales relative to pre-pandemic levels by about 3% in the April to June quarter. So those are the firms that the stock market is celebrating. Smaller firms, uh, the bottom 100 uh, of the top 500, uh, saw their sales fall by 18%. So that's, that's a big difference. Um, upper middle class households done well, they've stayed at home, they've been able to do their jobs. Lower middle class households on the front line, many have lost jobs. In fact, in India, for the first time, you see employment in agriculture go up from about 36% of the labor force to 39% over the course of the pandemic, suggesting people really don't have jobs in the, uh, in the you know, higher paying service and manufacturing sector, they're being forced to go back into low paying agriculture. And of course, children have suffered tremendously over this crisis, typically uh, sort of poor children, uh, because they haven't had access to uh, uh, facilities that allow them to study at a distance. The bottom line here is that across the emerging world, uh, these differentiations uh, create both uh, a, a strong pressure for more populist policies, but also a threat to macro stability via politics. Uh, we already see in Brazil uh, a impulse from Bolsonaro to spend more before the election, even as he faces uh, strong uh, opposition. Uh, and um, uh, in Chile, we see two of the main candidates for the presidency next year, a candidate on the extreme left, a candidate on the extreme right, I think you will see more radicalism in politics across the emerging world. Uh, and uh, that is going to create some disruption in the economic outlook there. So let, with that in uh, as a preliminary, let me hand it back to Danny. Thank you, Raghu. So there are, um, there are important divisions within countries, um, and you drew attention, partly those that are going to get aggravated uh, in the developing world, um, social income, 
regional occupational uh, divisions um, uh, that will get um, uh, um, deeper and, and, and you do attention to likely adverse political consequences of, of that. Um, uh, there are also divisions uh, across countries. And at least before uh, the pandemic, there were a lot of good news about what was happening in those divisions um, between countries. That is to say that countries that were relatively poor were growing more rapidly uh, as a group, uh, really for the first time um, since the Second World War. Um, where, uh, and this was not just East Asia and China and a few growth champions, but uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America experienced uh, some of the, you know, their highest growth rates in a long time. So poor countries were catching up in general uh, to, the, um, to the advanced world economically, um, although in many of them, though not in Latin America, uh, income inequalities were, were, were widening. Um, uh, and um, the, within divisions uh, were uh, meanwhile getting serious uh, in the advanced countries. And I think you sort of, the, the, you know, I think the subject of your most recent book um, on the third pillar was really sort of, was focusing on divisions largely in the advanced countries and the United States and, 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 and pro providing some remedies. Um, I'll, I'll get back to the developing world and the emerging markets uh, in a bit, but if I can ask you to say a little bit more about your, your current thinking about this, um, sort of what's happening uh, to these disparities within um, uh, the advanced world and the United States, because many of the things that you said prospectively about the developing world is actually things that were taking place in the advanced world before the pandemic or during the pandemic that this appeal to right-wing uh, authoritarian populism uh, in part because of uh, these um, uh, economic and social divisions um, and, and, and regional divisions uh, in these countries. Um, and, um, and, and, and so I want you to say a little bit more about your ideas on the importance of community, the importance of what you recently called inclusive localism. Um, as a way of dealing with it, with these uh, inequalities um, in the in the advanced world, right. um, so can you tell us something yeah. about that? So I mean, uh, there is both hope and a little bit of concern as uh, in what's happening in the industrial world, right? Uh, on the hope side, I think there's much more sensitivity uh, to the disadvantage, to the people being left behind. Uh, either expressed in concerns about race uh, or express, expressed in concerns about, uh, you know, frontline workers, uh, people who are uh, low skilled uh, and uh, still having to bear the brunt of, of the pandemic. I think the mood, uh, I mean, when you read some of the descriptions of the post-World War II mood, uh, where there was a sense that the country owed the, the soldiers, uh, whence you had the GI Bill and so on, that, that there was a sense that these people had fought while the uh, rich and the elderly had stayed at home. And, and therefore, there was a, a, a reason to help. And in fact, uh, there are a couple of Stanford professors who argue this is why uh, the tax rate could be 90% plus and, and stay that way because it was a payback uh, for, uh, for the... Uh, uh, for the for the work that the uh, the the poor and the and the young had done, I mean there seems to be a little bit of that mood now that uh, that the country owes uh, the frontline workers. Uh, there's more support for uh, you know a greater labor share for minimum wages for uh, uh, for strikes. Uh, big, uh, and and in fact you see the number of strikes also going up uh, from a. a redressing the balance perspective in terms of incomes, uh, this is not entirely bad. However, you know, what, what sort of is coming into people's pockets from one hand because of the pricing power of corporations is, is actually showing up in higher prices for goods and services, which is where we're getting some of the inflation. So it's not entirely an unmixed, unmixed uh, basket right now. But I do think the also, if you look at the nature of the packages that were established post uh, during the pandemic, uh, they were untargeted. Uh, and I think, you know, to some extent, the they were untargeted because you needed to get everybody's support. If you focused on on only the poor, 
then uh, you may not have got the Republicans on board in this country because they would say you're just pandering to your constituency. So there was sort of an indiscriminate uh, uh, sort of transfer. The good news, however, is that a lot of uh, people uh, in the uh, you know middle class, low middle class, use some of that money to redress their financial situation. Uh, household balance sheets look better. So these are all good things. And of course, with the infrastructure bill, uh, bill and the Build Back Better bill, there is more of a focus on uh, the disadvantage to try and see how they can uh, you know they can be helped. Uh, rolling out broadband, for example, to everyone is. In, in, a, in a rich country, uh, it's, it's almost become a necessity of life to have access to broadband and certainly to the new jobs that can be done at a distance. So I, I do think there are silver linings for the issues I talked about in my book, which is the most important is if there is a trend towards being able to do more jobs at a distance, that allows for the spatial spread of economic activity, which counters the agglomeration economies that were pushing concentration in the coastal cities uh, earlier. So if we can actually have a lot of people who sort of prefer you know, having large open spaces, but are very skilled and are willing to work, you can spread economic uh, incomes and economic activity across the country. Uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, you know, uh, London uh, sucks out all the oxygen from, from nearby. If people can stay 100, 200 miles from London because they need to go one day a week, a much greater uh, sort of uh, uh, part of the economy uh, benefits. So that, that, that I think is good. I am a little worried that you know, some of the spending we have in place um, is again, uh, less than, uh, uh, you know, it's not clear how well informed it is and how well targeted it, it is. Uh, again, I, I do understand um, uh, initially, uh, it was important to be untargeted, but but going forward, we're spending so much money. It would be nice to know what are the key programs that will help and offer communities a lot more say in what happens, whether it's infrastructure or on which spending programs they want. Now, uh, you know what I, I guess I'm arguing for is more uh, money going in the form of block grants to communities. Block grants are, uh, you know, for one segment of society, uh, a no-no because they they reflect uh, a sense that uh, you know they were often used to exclude uh, the uh, minorities. Uh, block grants to the states that were, uh, you know, quote unquote, racist or exclusionary, so that they could avoid uh, spending on federal programs that benefited the minorities. Uh, at some point, we have to get over that and and recognize that you can maintain some sort of uh, um, you can try and put some rules on how this can be spent, but you need to get people to spend on what most affects them. In some communities, it may be healthcare. In others, it may be the need for a you know stronger equipment in the community college. Decentralization, to my mind, is is important in every country. Uh, decentralization with some checks and balances. I'm not saying indiscriminate decentralization, but with technology, we have the ability to implement sort of uh, light checks and balances, making sure that it's not spent on uh, on feathering one's nest, and, and that, to my mind, would help people cope with uh, with uh, sort of the challenges that they face today. Which, as you as you well know, is as much, if not more, from automation than globalization in industrial countries. So it, it seems to me that there is an important political um, theme that's running through a, a lot of um, what you're saying now and, and what you've written about um, in the past. It's, it's really about um, um, distributing decision-making power uh, more widely, and in particular, delegating it uh, much more to towards the local communities um, that in some sense are in the best position to know what their priorities might be. And I like very much this emphasis of yours on, 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 on community and decentralization uh, as a counterbalance uh, to the usual discussion uh, that sort of is framed as um, a, a, a sort of this age old debate between markets uh, and the state. Um, and I think you very usefully uh, brought out the importance of, 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 of community. And I think some of the things that, that you've said um, are, are, are very much um, in line with that. 
So I would put, you know, so putting... let, let me interrupt a second, Danny. I mean, I'm actually drawing from your work here because, you know, you've talked a lot about this challenge between globalization and democracy, right? That, uh, that in a sense, the constraints it imposes on, on democracy. And you push that further down. It's, it's really an amplification of that saying that markets do impose uh, some constraints on decision making. But the answer is not to centralize decision making, which is the natural preference of markets. Let's, let's have one global rule for the world because then every market looks alike and I can roam across the world without borders. That's, that's the market preference. But if you, if you uh, decentralize, that empowerment is really important as, as a counter. Here is my own toolkit to deal with the specific problems that globalization creates for me. It's not that I wanna erect barriers at every village corner, but I want to have the power to deal with, uh, with relatively open, open uh, sort of markets. And that needs a decentralization rather than a centralization of political power. Well, and another way of saying this would be that, that um, and maybe that's my spin on what you're saying, is that you're also calling for a greater democratization of economic policy and saying that what has happened, some of our troubles has to do with the fact that these impersonal forces of the global market or the very personal but still very distant forces of large corporations um, is essentially has uh, undermined uh, the uh, democratic uh, decision making and, and, and you want you know, some of that restored back. So in that connection, maybe I think this is you know, the right point at which um, we would turn to developing countries and emerging markets because there is sort of this tension between, if you will, between democracy on the one hand and what um, might be called technocracy right the rule by the experts and the technocrats uh is is one of the issues that i think we confront and i think you confronted that i believe very you know directly um uh, in your role as a, as a central bank uh, governor is still the main issue in some ways in many countries it's certainly uh, in my own country of turkey where currently we're facing um a, a long drawn out currency crisis um, because of the, um, the politicization of the monetary policy and then significantly undermining of whatever independence the central bank had. And, you know, India is not there yet, perhaps, uh, but there is still tensions. Um, so how do we think about this role of, of uh, technocracy versus democracy sort of um, in the conduct of economic policy? Uh, in countries like uh, India? Um, where should we let the technocrats rule? Um, where should uh, there be much more day-to-day -day immediate political accountability? Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, it is very diff difficult for a technocracy to exist in an environment without trust. And this is where, you know, populists exploit the lack of trust in the technocracy. I mean, monetary policy decisions aren't easy to explain, right? And, you know, I mean, take, take trade, which you well know, the easiest thing to say is I'm gonna protect jobs by banning uh, imports. But we do know that there are, you know, spillover effects to exports and so on. It's more complicated, but from a, you know, communication perspective, it's very easy to say ban imports, create jobs, right? Uh, when you get to the second order effects, it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot harder to explain to the broader public. And this is where I think trust comes in, that uh, you trust the technocrats to make decisions in the larger interests of the people without having to explain every last detail of that decision. You, you trust them to uh, sort of raise interest rates at the right time, even though, you know, Everybody knows it hurts people, but it's for the larger good, right? Uh, you know, Mr. Erdogan has a view that uh, raising interest rates increases costs. Uh, and that seems like, you know, so obvious. Why is it that we crazy economists say raise interest rates at this time? The, the bigger sort of point needs, needs a little more explanation. And, and, and when you don't have trust, the direct political argument makes so much more sense, right? So th that's where I'm saying, uh, I, th I think what has happened is uh, 
the populace have uh, essentially painted the technocrats in a bad light. They can't be trusted. They care more about the international rather than the domestic. Uh, central bankers, they meet every month and a half in Basel and plot all these things against our domestic economy. How can I actually believe that these guys are, are patriotic citizens? At the same time, I think the, the populace themselves are guilty of centralizing power in their hands and not really respecting. I mean, they, they certainly uh, uh, emphasize the, the authority they get from uh, you know, large democratic wins, but uh, you know, they don't uh, emphasize the fact that they actually have sucked out power from the provinces, from the uh, localities. Um, and so that, that creates an interesting tension where uh, you've discredited the techno uh, technocrats, but you yourself are making decisions uh, partly uninformed by the technocracy, so which may be long run detrimental to the economy, but also uh, not informed by democracy as reflected in the opinions of so many uh, sort of elected sub-governments in, in your country. And, and this, uh, you know, one uh, example is the farm laws that India passed. Uh, they have some elements which are reasonable, which have been talked about for a long time, but they were one size fits all uh, without obtaining consensus, either from the, uh, you know, broader masses, which is difficult, but even from the state governments. And so you had the specter of a bunch of state governments saying, you know, this really doesn't make sense. It doesn't respect our difference uh, situation. And yesterday we saw the, uh, after much protest, the central government withdrew it. But I think the problem really is, is one of, of dialogue. Even the, uh, the populace aren't really truly respecting the democratic dialogue process. I would certainly agree with you that, uh, that we shouldn't look to the uh, populist, particularly the, um, uh, the, the, the right-wing populist for um, help with democracy. But on, I, I, I agree also that trust is extremely important, um, but it would appear that, that, that we technocrats did our best to lose that trust because of, of um, in other words, if we, if we lack trust, it's partly because of the way that technocrats presented many of the sort of burning issues of the day in 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 a, in a, in, a, in a light that um, put them put these policy issues as, as if they were simply questions of you know technical questions that only you know technocrats could answer, whereas deep down they had very significant impacts in terms of distribution, in terms of well-being in different parts of society, uh, well-being in in so you know in, in trade policy, for example, which you mentioned, um, you know sort of. Um, I think technocrats and economists generally poo-pooed the, um, the very severe distributional implications of um, NAFTA or um, opening up um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the world trading regime to China or um, you know, the impact that trade liberalization has had uh, in the agricultural sector in, in many developing countries. Um, uh, you know, after the you know financial crisis, um, the um, you know sort of support for more austerian policies, the policies of austerity, were often presented in a kind of a very technocratic light that there were these you know maybe ceilings on the debt to GDP ratio or or sort of arbitrary ceilings on how large a deficit could be, whereas they had you know huge effects on ordinary people and ordinary communities. And so I think that's partly, I think, how we've, less, we've, we've lost um, that, 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 that trust. And I think um, sort of it, it's, it's um, you know, how we rebuild that. Um, right. Is... And, and, and Danny, I mean, here, I, I have to say, you were one of the lone voices uh, basically saying, you know, let's, let's revisit what we, what we know about trade. Uh, let's not, not, be, I mean, you you are uh, for uh, generally more trade and, and and open markets, but let's also look at what consequences there are and try and address them. And 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 you were uh, in many ways a lone voice at at a time when there was immense talk about the benefits of trade liberal liberalization. Um, and you know, to some extent, I I do worry, and I don't know if you share this feeling that we get caught up in fads about what is right based on what is happening in the industrial countries where most of the economists are. 
So, uh, you know, I remember Petya Toplova, who's uh, at the IMF, wrote in her thesis about the downsides of trade in India, uh, about the increasing immiserization, et cetera, et cetera. And she couldn't get a decent job uh, when she graduated. This was, uh, uh, I think, the early 2000s. And then we have this series of papers by Otter, Gordon, et cetera, on the effects of Chinese trade on US communities. And that makes a big splash. And now everybody's concerned about the distributional effects of trade. Uh, so there is a little bit of an asymmetry here in, the, uh, in influence. Uh, similarly, I mean, if you look at some of the unconventional policies that have been adopted more recently in industrial countries, uh, we, uh, through the multilateral agencies said, this is crazy. Uh, when the uh, emerging markets adopted them. Of course, there were some places where it was crazy, but the notion that you spend more in times of, uh, of difficulty to support those who are, who are stressed, uh, I mean, that has gained currency only when the pain hits the industrial countries. So there is an asymmetry in how we see policies also, unless you truly experience it yourself. It's hard for you to understand why other countries do it, and, and that I, I, I worry a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, again, I, I do think there's a middle way, uh, but, but sometimes we don't see both sides. I totally agree on, uh, uh, with you on fads. Uh, sometimes I, I tell my students that by the time an idea becomes conventional wisdom, it's almost definitely wrong. Um, and, and, but there's also the issue that those fads tend to be, you know, generated and, and focused on the circumstances of the advanced countries, the industrial countries, which makes them doubly wrong, uh, because they're also not suited, uh, even at the time they were developing for the context in developing countries. I do want to turn to um, uh, just one final question I'll ask you before we turn to um, our audience, um, uh, just very specifically on, on India. Um, is, um, is, is, do you see India returning to the kinds of, of, of uh, rapid development and growth um, that the uh, you know, country was experiencing at least a few years, until a few years before the pandemic? You know, I, I would hope so. And I, I, I want to firmly believe that India has immense potential. I think that it has, uh, but it needs to uh, first fix some of the, uh, the problems uh, that the pandemic has created, including uh, many children out of school, falling behind, uh, possibly dropping out. That's, 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 that's uh, extremely important to fix. Also, people who have slipped from uh, the lower middle class into poverty. And, and I, I worry a little bit that uh, with the stock market breaking records every, every week and with uh, unicorns going public, there's a sense of euphoria which misses that uh, a fair number of Indians aren't participating in this in this euphoria. Uh, so that's that's one. The second I, I worry is that India needs a vision which is different from the old export-led growth followed by the uh, Asian tigers or uh, or or China, and, and that's partly because that path is so much more difficult today. But also, India is a democracy. Uh, that path uh, becomes easier when you can, uh, you know, uh, possess land on a whim and build infrastructure, etc., uh, etc., et to improve your logistics. becomes harder for a densely populated country like India, which has to respect democratic rights. And so, I think India has to craft its own way. Uh, I think the wrong attitude is we want to be like China. Uh, we don't have the system that China had, and probably for good reason. And, and, and I think we need to craft our own way. And I do believe that that way might emphasize our strengths, our, our debate, our, our um, you know, uh, ability to uh, be more democratic, to protect data, to protect privacy. Uh, we should build on that to provide uh, you know, um, valuable services to the rest of the world, rather than say we're going to go the old export, uh, manufacturing export-led growth way, which is, which is far more difficult today. That change in vision, uh, I think uh, we, need to, we need to embrace and, and work on it. Uh, but if we, if we try the old stuff, uh, I fear uh, we're not going to be as successful as we might otherwise be. 
I, uh, before you leave us, what about Turkey? Turkey um, is, um, uh, it's very easy for me to say that Turkey has a brighter future than it has had in <laughs> recent past, uh, because just the, re because the recent past has been uh, so, uh, so terrible, um, uh, primarily politically, but also economically. I think Turkey is a very interesting case where our usual story where uh, it you know, financial markets with disciplined governments has been turned on its head, that in fact, financial indiscipline uh, and fiscal indiscipline and economic indiscipline has been um, made much easier because of the ability of financial markets to essentially um, give uh, Erdogan a very, very long leash. Um, and, uh, and, and, um, and, and this has been a crisis, very long time coming. And I think in many ways, the surprise is how long it has taken. Um, and, and we don't necessarily even know that, that, you know, that we're going to be turning this around very, very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, um, a political leader that's, um, uh, that's entrenched and um, has a lot to lose uh, from leaving power. Um, so I worry that uh, we have not yet seen the worst uh, politically. But um, uh, let me now invite uh, Satwik Mishra uh, from the HKS uh, India Caucus, and he is going to moderate um, the remaining part of this session with questions uh, from our audience. Satwik. Thank you so much, Professor Rodrigue. This was a very enriching discussion. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions, some of them addressed to both of you, some of them addressed uh, to one of them. So I'll start, I'll start giving questions in batches of two. The first one is addressed to both of you. Uh, what are your views on the central bank digital currencies and its impact on the global financial structure? And uh, secondly, how do you view the increase in emerging market sovereign debt and, possi and possibly the increase in defaults affect the global economy? Danny, you want to go? No, Raghu, you go. Uh, okay, let me talk about central bank digital currencies, leave the sovereign debt to, to, to Danny to take up just so that we cover more questions. Uh, uh, you know, central bank digital currencies, uh, the Chinese are coming up with, uh, you know, they're the first major central bank to come up with one. Um, I think in China, the reasons uh, differ from the way, say, the US sees the CBDC. Uh, in China, uh, when you look at small value retail payments, they're dominated by two, two entities, uh, Tencent and Alipay. And uh, certainly there's a Chinese fear that domination by the private sector implies also concentrated risk. If one of these goes belly up, there will be a disruption in payments. Uh, they would like to have an official digital payment system, uh, which is where the uh, CBDC uh, comes in. Of course, it raises a whole set of additional questions, right? Uh, data, who owns the data that is collected by the CBDC? Can the government see the personal details of what people purchase? Uh, and uh, will that be a problem? Uh, the Chinese are trying to limit that through a two-tier system. And uh, they have this, uh, in my view, Orwellian term, controllable anonymity to describe how they will handle data, which to me basically seems like you know, uh, uh, for the most part, they won't look at the data, but if they do want to control that particular issue, they will uh, pierce through the anonymity and, uh, and get to see the data. And that to my mind, doesn't reflect adequate protection of, uh, of individuals. Uh, but of course, China uh, has uh, a rollout in place. Uh, they are trying to convince more merchants to do it. There is a big uh, uh, financial stability issue here, which is what if uh, you know, uh, people get scared uh, because of financial market uh, conditions, uh, what you have uh, with the possibility of a CBDC is a instantaneous bank run from uh, your deposit account into the CBDC. So that has to be controlled. Otherwise the uh, private bank system could collapse if in fact there are risks that emerge. So the Chinese to deal with this are limiting the amount in every CBDC account, but that also means, again, they have to know who has that account, how they operate. So lots of questions about data, about privacy that are raised by the central bank digital currency, as also the level playing field between the public sector and the private sector. In the US, they're worrying more about these issues. So 
the US CBDC is going to be longer in coming. In the meantime, there's something called Fed now, which is coming, uh, you know, in 2023, which is which will allow fast retail payments on a public network. Uh, India already has this with UPI, and uh, you know, with UPI, it seems to me the case for an Indian CBDC is uh, is not as strong as it would be without UPI. Um, on sovereign debt, I think that's a major issue. I think both because um, uh, underlying growth rates in the developing world are going to be smaller, much lower uh, going forward. Um, and secondly, because um, the foreign exchange generating capacity of developing countries, that is to export uh, earning capacity is significantly undermined by a variety of structural and technological uh, trends. Um, so that doesn't augur well. I think um, that there is going to be um, the issue of, you know, major restructuring um, it, 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 on a global scale is uh, has to be uh, seriously uh, thought of. I think one way of moving forward is actually to join sort of this debt issue with the um, um, with the climate change uh, challenge, which is a kind of a, a, a kind of a global quid pro quo, if you will, where the advanced countries offer significant uh, debt reductions in return for significant investments in decarb decarbonization uh, in the developing world, um, and, and 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 that kind of a of a bargain, um, I think you know could kill two birds in one stone, and I hope something like that might be worked out. Uh, so the next question, uh, Professor Rajan, how can academic institutions strengthen their research towards practical bottom-up solutions for vulnerable communities? And Professor Roderick, you have often argued that economies highly exposed to the global economy need more social protection. How would you analyze uh, Chile from this lens, given its upcoming presidential elections? Uh, uh, quickly on, uh, I mean, I think the first thing is to engage more. And I, I think certainly in the United States, many universities are now paying more attention to the communities they live in uh, as you know, uh, students uh, and uh, some of the staff who come from the local community press the faculty to get more engaged. Um, engagement often prompts research. So, so I, I think that first step is, is happening now uh, earlier, there was sometimes a sense that, uh, you know, these elite universities were oases uh, in, in the middle of uh, or more, more of poorer neighborhoods and more difficult neighborhoods. Now, there's a sense that they should have some responsibility also for participating in, in neighborhood uh, activities and, and helping the neighborhoods. And I think that's a good thing that that certainly breeds more engagement. I, I know the University of Chicago is is currently engaged in some of these activities. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say anything specifically on, on, on Chile, but um, I, I do think that our, our, our standard, um, that we have to move beyond the standard welfare state uh, model of um, redistribution through the fiscal system uh, as, as a way of addressing the challenges that, that we face. I think the, the fundamental issues, which I think in many ways uh, along the same lines as, as what Raghu has emphasized, is the need to ensure that we can generate sufficient uh, quantity of good jobs, uh, particularly in those regions that have been left behind. That's an issue that it cannot be solved simply by more redistribution, more, ta more taxation, more, uh, more spending um, of the, you know, of, of the, you know, the, the, the standard kind. And that's, I think, where sort of, you know, I, I join with the, the first question, the question of, of um, or the first part of the question, which is really about the importance of doing research that connects uh, um, what, how we think about policy with its impacts on the local communities and what works best uh, in different local communities. Um, my uh, Kennedy School colleague Gordon Hansen and I, in fact, are, are just now starting a, a, a multi-year uh, research project, which is focused especially directly on this question of um, distilling the experience of local practitioners, uh, people involved in, in local training programs, local economic development programs, joining it to the skills of the economists who can do systematic uh, quantitative analysis uh, using these local experiments 
and then also joining with the um, the theories of socials and social theorists and organizational theorists who are sort of are broadening our horizons in terms of different types, alternative forms of capitalism, alternative forms of market institutions, and so forth. So that's our agenda. So we're very much hoping to engage in this kind of research, both that both distills. The, the knowledge that already exists in the local communities and that, that experiential knowledge, uh, as well as, as building new knowledge that can in turn help others. Uh, so Professor Rajan, what are your views on the need for an urban employment guarantee program in the Indian context? Professor Roderick, in light of the increasing wealth inequality, what are your views on wealth tax? Um, uh, you know, uh, one of the difficulties um, you know labor in in india has experienced is when the factories uh, when the employment in the big cities shuts down there is really no safety net that they have and this is what uh, prompted the vast migration back to the villages it's uh, what also explains why employment in agriculture has gone up because that's the most sort of uh, flexible employment it's not necessarily that all these people are actually earning a salary, but at least they can go work their fields. And of course, Narega, which is the uh, Manrega, which is the uh, rural employment guarantee program is, is the other safety net. And you can see a, a immense use of Manrega right now relative to the past, suggesting that, uh, that jobs are, are scarce. So um, there has been talk about a urban employment guarantee scheme. And as a safety net, it seems to me that it is well worth exploring. Jean Drez has some ideas about it. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, it is a, a safety net, uh, but I think there are ways of, of doing that, that that certainly need to be explored. It it's, it's in nobody's interest that the uh, unemployed in the cities uh, basically feel unsafe there and then be forced to migrate in, in really tragic circumstances back to their villages. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, it, is, is, it is way past due, should have been explored in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, going forward to protect against calamity, uh, it certainly is something that we need to put in place. Um, I mean, I'm in general in favor of the wealth tax uh, in view of the, um, you know, the inexorbitant inequalities that it currently exist in many countries. At the same time, uh, I, I think that the major um, economic and social issues of our time um, are not going to be addressed uh, simply by um, redistribution. Uh, that was the point that I was trying to make before. So I think if we focus only on redistribution, only on sort of taxing the, 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 you know, the, the wealthy, I think we're going to miss an important um, uh, dimension of what we need to do. And what we need to do is, is to really ensure that we are, are generating productive employment opportunities for uh, the poor, for the lower middle classes, for the middle classes. Um, and we're finding ways of propping up the middle classes back up again. Um, these middle classes have, and the lower middle classes have suffered significantly as a consequence of changes in our technologies, changes in our uh, global economic context. Um, and I think that problem can be fixed only by generating adequate employment and productive opportunities for people who are, um, who, who need them with, um, with good, you know, career ladder prospects. Uh, I think sort of wealth tax is an important part um, in terms of raising revenue, uh, in terms of addressing some of the extreme inequality at the top, uh, but that's not going to solve our main problems. Maybe we can take a final question. It's for uh, Professor Rajan and Professor Roderick. How do you regard the role of technological advancement and innovation in either addressing or accelerating the socioeconomic inequality as it exists? Um, very quickly, I mean, um, I, I think uh, technology uh, is, is, is a tool, right? And, uh, and it can be used both for the good and for the bad. I think, um, I, I, I think it offers us a chance uh, to remedy some of the inequality, whether it's through, um, you know, uh, better teaching, uh, 
uh, over uh, the internet, supported by a physical presence locally. Uh, you can scale up good teaching across, uh, across the country, across the world. That's one example where technology helps. Working at a distance, as we talked earlier, is, is another example where it helps. It also uh, helps automate uh, away the most difficult, unpleasant jobs, uh, the most boring jobs. Uh, at the same time, we have to make sure that uh, it doesn't sort of uh, uh, hurt uh, you know, uh, workers and that there are ways that you, know, you can add man plus uh, machine or woman plus machine and get more than the individual parts. I think we need to work on that. That requires job design, that requires creativity. And if we can do that, there's no reason why technology should only have a downside. It can have lots of upside. I agree. I agree very much with that. And I think, you know, we often think about uh, technology as something that just falls on our lap, sort of ready made and of which we have no control. But, you know, we are constantly shaping the direction of technological change, uh, both through um, our policies, you know, the way we tax labor and capital. Right now, for example, we tend to uh, subsidize capital while we tax uh, labor. So it's not necessarily that surprising that so much innovation and technological effort goes into automating um, and, and, uh, and, and replacing labor. Um, we have sort of the whole ethos and norms around Silicon Valley and the, um, and the venture capital sort of culture and ecosystem that has very definite views about, um, you know, what kind of technologies, what kind of innovations to invest in. Um, you know, I think as a society, when we decide that there are certain areas where we want to innovation to go in, then there is always a kind of a, um, a, an effort to do that, I think. The, the area where we most directly sort of orient technology, for example, is in, uh, is in mil military technologies, technologies that are oriented towards national defense. I mean, there's the federal government uh, spends inordinate amount of resources, uh, not just financial, but organizational, uh, to ensure that the right kind of innovations happens. Um, more recently, we've understood that, you know, we can also you know, innovate uh, in the green technology, you know, sort of environmentally friendly direction. So now we're spending more in terms of in the direction of green technologies, trying to orient the direction of technological change uh, in an environmentally friendly manner. Where I think we've spent the least amount of thinking, uh, when where I think the social uh, value would be very high, is also thinking about the direction of technological change in a more employment friendly uh, manner. That is to say that uh, rather than thinking about how we can replace uh, displaced labor, um, how can we think of technologies that's going to augment labor, that's going to help people do their job better? That's a different way of looking at technology that will, you know, instead of, for example, having a large scale robots and, and uh, that come to displace uh, factory workers, it might be smaller scale uh, uh, robots that you work together with humans. In fact, many manufacturers have been moving in that direction. That might mean creating AI tools um, that uh, enable uh, workers uh, to produce goods in a much more cut or services in a much more customized uh, way to different market segments uh, and, and, and provide services that are much more keeping track of what the cons consumers need in real time. Uh, that's again sort of technology working with people. So I think we need to think much more creatively about sort of how uh, the direction in which uh, we're orienting technology that, that serves society's needs rather than simply repeating the mantra that we have to adjust to technology. I'm afraid I think we've run out yeah. uh, over our, our time. So let me thank you, Satwik and the um, uh, HKS India Caucus, uh, but uh, let me thank also the CID, uh, uh, but most of all, um, let me thank uh, Raghu Rajan for um, uh, making some time for, for, for this discussion. Um, it's been very stimulating. I know I've enjoyed it a lot. I hope we can do it again. Um, and thank you all to the audience who have listened to us and who have asked questions, uh, many of which we could not answer, unfortunately. Uh, see you all soon uh, on a different event. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.